Welcome back to part four of four. Not one of them is dated millions of years old by carbon dating. Lots of things like that. You tend not to hear about these in the uh, secular school system, uh, sadly. But there are all kinds of physical processes that... All right, let's have a quick look at this slide here. Hundreds of physical processes set limits on the age of the world. Well, for starters, your title says there are hundreds, but your numbers only go up to 53. Which is also weird because there are only 39 actually there. Also, I don't see anything actually on this list that would in any way limit the age of the Earth. But I do see some weird things on this list that I want to point out real quick. For starters, how could you tell anything about the age of the Earth from human population or human civilization? Natural plutonium? Plutonium doesn't exist in nature. It's a completely man-made metal. Oldest living plants? Well, there is this tree that I think is still alive in California that's about 13,000 years old, which is a bit more than twice the age of the universe according to creationists. How the hell does the rotation of spiral galaxies affect the age of the Earth? For that matter, what does interstellar gas expansion or the decay of comets have to do with the Earth? Titan's methane loss and decay of Saturn's rings? Did you even look at the stuff before you put it on this slide? Alright, this is full of too much crazy for me. I I'm just going to move on now. Limit the age of the Earth to much less than the billions of years that most people are taught. The rate, for example, at which salt goes into the ocean. You know, even freshwater rivers have a little bit of salt in them. They pick it up from the continents, they dump it into the ocean. The water evaporates, but it leaves the salt. And so oceans are consistently getting saltier and saltier. You can get rid of a little bit of the salt with salt sprays and things like that. But uh, essentially, 450 million tons of new salt enter enters the ocean every year. The oceans are getting saltier. Now, you can work the math backwards. And uh, you know, even being very generous to the critics and assuming the slowest possible conditions, the oceans can't be more than 62 million years old. Because at that point, that's an upper limit, right? Because you can't have less salt than no salt. So that's assuming they had none to begin with. Obviously, if the oceans started salty, then they're much younger than that. So that's a problem, though, for the secularists, because they believe the oceans are 3 billion years old. But they can't even be anywhere close to that. OK, so using salt in the ocean as a clock is an idea proposed about 300 years ago and has since been proven wrong. This method has two fundamental flaws that prevent one from getting an accurate date. First off, there is no way to tell how salty the ocean started out as. So you have no baseline. Secondly, it doesn't take into account the amount of salt that has been pulled under as the oceanic plates get pushed under the Earth's crust and melted. On the other hand, it's perfectly compatible with 6,000 years because it's an upper limit. 62 million as an upper limit would include 6,000 years as a medium or lower limit, and then the secular age is way off. Scientists have long since abandoned this method of determining the Earth's age at all because of the aforementioned reasons. Likewise for the accumulation of mud on the ocean floor. I would like to point out that your own slide shows that your argument is already wrong. You, you measure the amount of mud that's there, you measure the rate at which it accumulates, you find it takes less than 12 million years at present rates. And that assumes there was no worldwide flood, which would dump mud on the ocean floor very quickly. That also assumes there's no subducting plates, like your slide showed, to pull the mud under the Earth's crust. And so that's consistent with the biblical time scale, but it's not consistent with the billions of years. Well, actually, because it's a fundamentally flawed test for determining the age of the Earth, it's not really consistent with any time scales. Lots of things like that. Human population. How long does it take to get Earth's current population of human beings from just two? It doesn't take anywhere close to millions of years. The human population can't be used to determine the age of the Earth because it doesn't change in any sort of constant rate. In fact, before modern science came along, the Earth could only support a small fraction of the current world population. Now, as you can see from this chart, about 100 years ago, there was about 1.6 billion people on this Earth. But then modern science happened, and now there's about 6.9 billion people on this Earth. That's a huge leap in the world's population. Before that, the world's population would have been fairly stable, except for at a few points where an agricultural advancement would allow for more people to be alive at the same time. Not anywhere close. It takes a few thousand years, something like 4,000 years, because the human race had to start over with Noah and his family. Wait, what? That's your justification for using Earth's population to date the Earth? There's absolutely no logic to your argument at all. 
So it, it's very consistent with that. World population growth, we've been able to measure that. Well, I hadn't expected you to provide your own graph of the world's population. Well, first thing I noticed is that you have shifted the years over so that it looks like the population increases at a constant rate. This seems a little dishonest. Uh, to some extent over the centuries. The best evidence, though, that the world's thousands of years old, not millions or billions, because all of these are circumstantial. They're good, but they're circumstantial. We only have one that's definitive. We have the testimony of the one who created the heavens and the earth. And he tells us when he made it. He tells us he made it in six days, and he tells us from those genealogies you'd love to read before you go to bed, and so-and-so begets so-and-so. You add up those ages, and you find it was a few thousand years ago that God created the heaven and earth and all that's in them. So basically the only evidence for any of your argument is the Bible, which you claim was written by your magic sky daddy, but have no evidence to back up any of your or its claims. And uh, that's very clear. The, the science lines up with it, but the Bible's very clear. Actually, the whole reason why you creationists keep doing these lectures is because science disagrees with pretty much every aspect of the Bible. So the secular scientists say the Earth's billions of years old, take my word for it. God says I created in six days, take my word for it. No, scientists actually say the Earth is billions of years old, and here is the evidence and reasons we have arrived at that conclusion. While creationists say they have a magic book given to them by their magic sky daddy that explains everything, so please give them your faith and money without any evidence to support their claims. And by the way, it's not because of the evidence that evolutionists believe in millions of years. Yes, it is. It isn't, because we've seen the evidence really is very consistent with biblical creation. You haven't shown any evidence that is consistent with biblical creation. All you have done is demonstrate that you don't understand science. They have a philosophy that drives them to interpret the evidence that way. Now, we all have a philosophy. We all interpret the evidence in light of our philosophy. It's just, mine works. Yours works, and science doesn't? Well, let's take a moment to think about that. I can't help but to notice that to help you do this presentation, you're using cameras, microphones, a laptop, projectors, and lights, which are all things that we have thanks to scientific philosophy, which you say supposedly doesn't work. So, what has the Christian philosophy given us? The Dark Ages, slavery, and the Inquisition come to mind? Mine is self-consistent because I base mine on scripture. How does that make it in any way consistent? What about fossils? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were wrapping up your presentation there and weren't going to talk about them after all. I was sort of given the impression that fossils take, you know, millions of years to form. Well, here you have a fossil ichthyosaur, a marine reptile now thought to be extinct. And this thing was fossilized, killed and buried and fossilized in the process of giving birth. You see the baby ichthyosaur being born there? They were born tail first because they had to swim to the surface to get their first breath of air as air breathers. Really fascinating. Yeah, but there a fish fossilized in the process of eating another fish? So again, I don't think that's taken millions of years. Obviously, the, the, the thing was killed and buried quickly at least, and then it must have fossilized relatively quickly. You can even see some of the stomach contents from the ichthyosaur. I was kind of hoping that you might explain how that couldn't fossilize over millions of years. But you seem to just be satisfied with asserting that as fact. Now, clearly the animal and its baby was trapped and killed by the mud and allowed to fossilize together. See, people think that, well, you know, something dies and it just slowly fossilizes. Most things don't fossilize at all. And we sort of know that from experience, right? I've been picking on dogs. Let's pick on cats now, okay? Let's suppose that we're going to do a little experiment here on our dead cat, Earl. And day one, dead cat on grass. And we got the sign there, so nobody's going to touch it. All right. Day three, wait a little while. Now you got a smelly dead cat on the grass. Uh, day nine, very smelly dead cat on the grass. Uh, day 20, parts of Earl missing. Day 38, more of Earl missing. Day 65, Earl's missing. Yes, okay. Things don't just slowly fossilize over millions of years when they're exposed to the environment like that. They decay. They're recycled back into the environment. They're picked off by scavengers and what have you. Things don't just slowly fossilize over millions of years. You have to bury something to get it to fossilize, really, to protect it. You seem to be contradicting what you said a minute ago. You have to do some, something to protect it, and, and burying is, is usually the, the way to go. But even there, I was given the wrong impression. I was told that the fish dies, it sinks down to the bottom, it's slowly covered with sediment over millions of years. But you see, if, the, um, if this layer was deposited you know, or this layer was deposited millions of years after that layer, the top of the fish would have decayed already. 
To my human viewers, I apologize for the pain your face must now be experiencing after that face palm moment. Fossils are quite rare because they require very specific conditions to occur in order to make one. Your fish there would never become a fossil because the first requirement is rapid burial, which quickly isolates the body from the environment. The second requirement is the animal must not be exposed at all at any time during the fossilization process. Lastly, there must be another process happening simultaneously that allows minerals that will last longer to replace the minerals from the bones as they break down. The whole thing has to be very pretty quick. Uh, fish tend to float anyway, right? Or they're picked off by scavengers, and they don't just sink to the bottom and wait to be fossilized. It doesn't happen. Actually, when something dies in water, it first sinks to the bottom where it decays a bit. Then, after a little while, the gases will build up in the animal from the decay process, which will then cause it to float to the surface. And then, after a little while, the gases will get released and the animal sinks again. Now, if you really want to form a fossil fish, here's how you do it. You go home to your aquarium. <laughs> <laughs> and you dump some concrete on your fish. There you go. That's going to kill him. It's going to bury him. And he's going to fossilize. All right, as long as the minerals are moving through there are right, he'll, he will permineralize. That's what a fossil is. It's the minerals moving through and filling in all the little holes in the bone. Usually the flesh has time to decay away, but the bone gets uh, permineralized. And so uh, that's how you make a fossil. It doesn't take long times. So it just takes the right conditions. Wow, you are so close there. You were right up until you said it didn't take a long time. And we can fossilize things quickly in a laboratory. It doesn't take a long time. Well, I would believe that it doesn't take as long under laboratory conditions. I would still need a citation from you to believe that it doesn't take a long time. What about the types of fossils we find? We find fossils of fish and horses and people and so on, but we don't find one kind changing into another. So we're back to kinds. Until you tell us what a kind is, we can't really find any kinds at all. And so when you see things like this in the textbook, the evolution of the horse, and you say, boy, there are a lot of different varieties of horse there, right? That's what I'd expect in the creation view. So in the creation view, you'd expect horses to have existed in some form or other for millions of years? Now, they can line them up, right? But you can line up a, you know, a fork and a spork and a spoon, but that doesn't mean that one changed into the other, right? You're comparing the evolutionary branch of an animal to man-made eating utensils? I'm not really following your logic here. I mean, just because there's a sequence doesn't mean it's an evolutionary sequence. These are just different varieties of horse. Oh, I see what you're saying now. Yeah, you can't just put things next to each other in a line and claim that they are somehow related. So good thing scientists don't do that. They use evidence to show that animals are related and have changed over time. And the rib, the number of ribs is different, and the feet are a little different. And you say, oh, yeah, but one, one of them is really big and one of them is really small. So what? We have different breeds of horse today. These are both adult horses. They're just different breeds. Different breeds are not the same thing as different species. A lot of variation within a kind. That's exactly what I'd expect given biblical creation. Until you define what a kind is, no one knows what to expect from biblical creation. The kinds of fossils that we find are exactly what we'd expect given the variation within the kind that the Bible teaches. I'm not an expert on horses, but that looks like a list of breeds to me. But since you started off with a picture of different species, I think you're trying to confuse the two together and make us think that the previous slide either showed different breeds or this one shows different species. Either way, I think you're trying to pull a fast one here. What about the rocks in which these fossils are found? Don't rocks take millions of years to form? Okay, so I had to rewind that question a few times before my brain could accept that you actually just asked that. Didn't you talk about how you guys tried to radioactively date freshly formed volcanic rock earlier? Why is this even a question that you're asking? You've already answered it yourself earlier in your own presentation. The answer is no. Rocks do not take millions of years to form. All that is required for one to form is a state change from liquid to solid in whatever it is that magma is made out of. Not at all. Here's a set of car keys embedded inside solid rock. I don't think that took millions of years to form. Okay, well, just as I said, it only requires a state change to make a rock, so... all right? Unless cars go back a lot more than I think they do. Uh, here's a man-made clock embedded inside solid rock. How about that? 
Okay, we've already established that rocks can form very quickly, so what's your point? I don't think that took millions of years. Well, surely all these layers of rock shown here took millions of years. There's a person down there at the bottom for scale. See that? Ah, okay. You're trying to conflate rocks and rock layers as being the same thing. They aren't. While rocks only require a state change, rock layers require different events to slowly add layers of rock on top of already existing rock. For example, volcanic activity can create a layer of rock, soot, and ash. A flood could then later happen and create a layer of mud in organic material, which dries out after the flood finishes. These events and others occur over and over again at various times, resulting in the formation of different rock layers, which can tell us a lot about what happened in the Earth's past. Also, each layer needs time to solidify before the next event occurs, or the two events will form a single layer instead of their own individual layers. If, for example, you have one flood happening right after another, their muddy organic layers will merge together to form one uniform mass. Whereas if the first flood layer has time to solidify, it will produce two completely different and distinguishable layers. Those layers did not exist before 1980. Wow. I knew you were young Earth creationists, but I didn't realize you thought the Earth was that young. Those were all produced in the Mount St. Helens eruptions. Isn't that interesting? And they're rock, they're solid rock now. They were formed by a pyroclastic flow that came out of that volcano. Alright, so I did some googling to see what this was about, and what I found is that it's not made by a pyroclastic flow. When the eruption started, there was a landslide that created this uniform mass that we see at the bottom. Next, it rained light and dark ash for about 12 hours, creating this portion in the center that looks like, but isn't, strata. And finally, the top layer is a mixture of ash, soil, and other debris that's left there by a mud flow. Furthermore, this is just a weird anomaly, and the place where the picture was taken is pretty much the only place you can see it. And Mount St. Helens was a small volcano, by volcano standards, really. The Bible says that during the Great Flood, all the fountains of the Great Deep burst forth. That might indicate all the volcanoes on Earth going off, something like that. So, And it carved out a, again, the Mount St. Helens eruption carved out a canyon, one fortieth the scale of the Grand Canyon. It, does, it, it did this in days. It doesn't take millions of years for these things to happen. It happens quickly under the right circumstances. All right, out of curiosity, I pulled up Google Maps and looked at Mount St. Helens. Now, I would think that anything with enough force behind it to carve out a canyon is not going to get along well with turns. And so I would expect any canyon made by such an event to be more of a straight line outward from the center of the explosion. But I'm not seeing anything like that. I see the blowout area from where the eruption removed a large chunk of the mountain. I see a few rivers, none of which looked like they might have been carved out by an explosion. I suppose maybe the blowout area might count as a canyon? I'm afraid that if there is one, I'm not seeing it. So after that, I took another look at the picture you show, and that doesn't look like it was carved out by an explosion either. Not only is it turning, but it also appears to be joining up with another canyon, which makes me think this canyon was actually carved out by a river. Now, I'm not a geologist and can't really tell what I'm looking at, and I would normally give a person the benefit of the doubt. But throughout this presentation, you've pretty much lied about almost everything. So I'm afraid I can't give you the benefits of any doubts about this picture. So you see, when we take a look at geology and we see how these rock layers form today, and we see how they can form under catastrophic conditions, we find that it's really very consistent with what we'd expect from Genesis. Asserting that doesn't make it true. If anything, what has been demonstrated here is the exact opposite. What do the rocks really mean? They don't really indicate millions of years of evolution. What they really teach us is repent. Wow, that's a complete non sequitur. Those two things literally have nothing to do with each other. They tell us that God judges sin. How do rocks tell you that God judges sin? That's what all these fossils indicate. That, they indicate that there was a worldwide flood. How do fossils indicate that there was a worldwide flood? You haven't demonstrated a way by which all the fossils could be produced by a flood. And that's, that was made necessary because God is a righteous God, and he judges sin. He is just. Another complete non sequitur. He is righteous. He's also merciful, and he provided a way of escape. You say that after just literally talking about the flood. And that was what the uh, ark was all about, right? The ark was the way of escape. Only for Noah's family and some animals. 
Noah was a preacher of righteousness. I'm sure he was preaching, come on board the ark and be saved. No, God told them the very select few who could be saved. Everyone else never got the option. And yet only a very few people, only his own family, heeded that call. No, they were the only ones allowed to go aboard the ark. And I think it's interesting, too, that God was the one that closed the door. God was the one that decided time of mercy over time of judgment now. That door was already closed to everyone before Noah even built the ark. And that opportunity is uh, slim for everyone because God gives us so many years to uh, receive him, to repent of our sin, to receive him, and then that door closes. He expects us to make that decision completely uninformed about it. And the moment we actually have all the facts, it's too late. Well, this, it's, you know, it's so important to learn about this stuff because this will come up you know, in, in conversations with people. People will ask about Genesis and can you really defend it and so on. And so for that reason, we have lots of wonderful resources that I encourage you to check out on the tables out there. One that covers just everything I covered today. And now we have come to the real reason for this presentation. To shill your pseudoscience onto the masses. But I'm not going to let you shill your garbage on my channel. So now we have come to the end and finally finished. So I hope you guys got something useful out of this, and with that, I'm going to sign off.